I remember the first time I went to a major archive. When I was a graduate student, I went to the public record office in England. I don't know if you've ever been there. Um, well, you don't see the archives because they're vast, but what you see is the room of the catalogues of the archive. The room of the catalogues of the archive is a room about this size, and it's covered in catalogues. And every catalogue is a catalogue to thousands of documents. It's like you're in a Borghesian nightmare. So and, uh, you realize one thing at that moment. If you don't know what you want to look for, you're lost. Those catalogues are not going to tell you anything. You have to go in knowing what the question is that you put to them. You have to think of history as a kind of conversation between uh, uh, the archive as the trace of what happened in the past and the present, which is, is generating all kinds of questions in our minds that we want answered. So the, the, the present then and maybe now still generates all kinds of questions about how can good men do terrible things, uh, uh, about, uh, uh, about what, how you really should or can fight a partisan war. Uh, how you should think about the enemy. It's the present that generates those questions. These are questions that are with us now, that we then take to the archive. Mark Mazauer, historiador e professor na Universidade de Columbia, em Nova York. Mazauer documenta a queda da Europa no século XX, um continente mergulhado nas trevas e dilacerado pela guerra e pela barbárie. As tragédias europeias revelaram a necessidade de tornar o mundo governável. A administração e o governo do mundo é uma história de dois séculos, uma narrativa que Mazauer revisita com um misto de ceticismo e esperança. Hoje, a Europa deixou o centro do palco. O capital financeiro ganhou proeminência e ameaça à democracia. Alguns creem que a tecnologia e a prosperidade não terão fim, outros duvidam. A história é uma conversa que continua. In the past, Europe meant uh, a kind of civilizing mission. And sometimes it, there, there was a racial dimension to that, often there was. Sometimes it was more a question of a kind of institution building and ethical mission that the Europeans had figured things out better than anybody else. And, and if other people wanted to be civilized, they'd better let the Europeans show them how to do it. That was the basic idea. Now, that idea uh, collapsed at about the time that Europe ceased to be a major world force, around the 1950s, when it was cut in two and torn itself apart. And so we're in this new situation where we want a kind of Europe that comes together after the Cold War. And we still talk this old language of a European project. On the whole, I don't think that many people today believe like the Victorians did, that it is Europe's mission to show the world something. But, but some people do think that still, even if the mission is a certain humane kind of capitalism. And that was a very common idea just before the crisis. In 2004, five, six, a lot of people were writing, Europe's mission is to show there's a third way between Chinese authoritarian capitalism on the one hand, and American brutal laissez-faire capitalism on the other, and this is Europe's world mission. So they, they, they still talked in this very old way about what Europe should do for the world. 
the question is, uh, for, to me, can we enunciate a, a vision of Europe that's powerful and persuasive for Europeans that doesn't involve telling the rest of the world what they should be doing? You talk about Europe or Europeanism, if you want, combination of social conservatism, as you put it, high culture, human rights, and on the other hand, cultural pluralism, liberal expansion of rights, etc. Do you think, and this is a quote you use that George Perak that you have in one of your books, the vastness of their desires paralyzed them? I don't think so, although you could say that in the past something like that was true, in, in that people in Europe had these very, very different conceptions of what they wanted. Um, I think the, the trouble now is we've abandoned a lot of those conceptions. So the trouble now is, is not that lots of people believe in socialism and lots of people believe in fascism and, and so on, and lots of people hope that technology will save us. Um, mostly people don't believe anything with the same force that they did 50 years ago. So the problem now seems to me a different one, which is how do you articulate persuasive vision for Europe in a world where most Europeans have lost faith and lost hope in any kind of guiding political principles other than let's hang on to some of the good things that we had. Uh, and it's even more of a problem because I think European political elites, uh, as the generations changed, also their horizons narrowed and they became less and less able to articulate these kind of grand visions. So looking at the crisis in the Eurozone, uh, in the last few years, it was very striking to me how rarely European leaders were able to articulate a kind of long-term vision for, for Europe that went beyond, we must save the Euro, otherwise there will be the apocalypse. There, were, there, was, there was no vision of the better society or, or the, the communal good. Uh, and that's something new. I think 50 years ago, we would have had people offering such visions. And they would have been uh, drawing on reserves of ideas that have run dry, whether those reserves were Marxism and socialism or social Catholicism. Uh, they all had resonance for people. And they don't seem to work in the same way. Uh, so we have ghosts of this now. We have, you know, the free marketeers who... Uh, we, we have people who still believe that opening up the web and uh, the t moving the technological frontier will, will somehow bring prosperity to everybody. But most people, I think, have a much more sceptical and nuanced view. And so we're in this sceptical world. And so Europeans are not paralysed by the kind of multiplicity of their desires, but I think they're paralysed by their real inability to to believe in any of them or that any of them could come true. And that's not something you can blame them for. I think that's quite a logical and rational position, but it, 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 it creates, it creates a, a new set of problems for us. Do you think this relation between Europe and the United States, is it that the United States is the policeman acting on behalf of these European values. And the European talk about values, not, not civilization anymore, values, is just a way to disguise the decadence and weakness of Europe? Well, decadence and weakness are these words that you're drawn to use if you're still hoping for Europe, the great world power. As I say, I'm, I'm not particularly hoping for that. So I don't think there's any decadence or weakness involved in not being in a position to impose your norms anymore. That's just the rest of the world has changed and perhaps the rest of the world was never that interested in European norms. We just thought they were or thought they should be. Uh, so I'm not worried about European decadence and European weakness. Uh, as for the question of relying on the United States and what, what that means, um, there is reliance on the United States in a very specific way, which is that Europeans have given up paying for militaries. Uh, whereas the Americans are still just quite happy to pay for the military. This may be changing, as we can see. So the Syria debate may be 
the, the clearest indication yet that Americans are getting a bit fed up of paying for a huge military to go around the world. Now, if the Americans stop, and if they change their attitude about where their national security interests are, then Europeans may have to decide whether they need to pay more for security or whether they live in a world, and it may be true, where that kind of old security concern isn't a problem anymore, and where therefore you don't need large armies. So that's a very specific way in which they relied on Europe. That's going to be scrutinized in the future, I think. But I don't think the Americans ever felt they needed the Europeans to articulate their values for them. I think the, the American polity since the co early Cold War has been very good at enunciating its own set of values. And often those were couched in terms of America, the American exceptionalist destiny for the world, and not, with very little reference to Europe. Well, Europe was a kind of, had a very ambiguous relationship always to what Americans thought the world should look like. I mean, America was history's answer to Europe. One of your main areas of research is this idea of governing the world. At some point you say, I, I am in favor of the United Nations, but I don't really know why. Can you tell us more about this rational side, emotional side on, around this idea of governing the world? So this was a project that I think probably started as a result of moving to the United States in 2004, the year after the invasion of Iraq, which had placed the UN in a very ambiguous position. A lot of people were still talking about the UN, about the uselessness of the UN and so on. And for whatever reason, I had always thought of myself as somebody who was glad that the UN existed and that such organizations existed. But then if you, if you ask me why I was glad, I had a really hard time articulating what they were there for in any kind of plausible way. And so that's, I think, that that was the question from the present. Well, what is this organization? And I'm a historian, so to answer that question, I tend to say, well, the first step is to figure out where it came from, what it was supposed to do when it was set up. What was the real story, not the myth? Uh, and so I started out doing that. And then I realized that, well, the UN in itself is not that important and it's not that interesting. It's been marginal and peripheral to most great events in world history, even since it's been around. So. The UN was interesting as part of a bigger subject. The bigger subject was how had people thought or hoped or feared that the world might be governed? And that took you to an even earlier subject. At what point did we start to imagine that we could govern the world? And I'm now talking about something very specific. I'm not talking about when we imagined that God could govern the world, which is a very old story, and you could go back to the Bible. And I'm not even talking about the medieval idea that a wise emperor could govern the world in God's name. I'm talking about when we decided it was a problem of management. And that's, that's a 200-year-old story, and uh, that was the, the story that I tried to explore. What do you think is the role of inter international military intervention that has been very much in the limelight, uh, connected with this idea of governing the world? Well, remember that the very beginning of this idea of a world of sovereign nations working harmoniously together with one another was a very strong idea of non-intervention. And I'm thinking of the Monroe Doctrine, of the idea in the 1820s that in the Americas, North and South, you were going to see emerging this new way for states to get along. It was going to be completely different from Europe, where empires would send their armies into Spain, they would send armies into Naples to intervene. And so it was powerfully non-interventionist. Now, then some people said, well, that was the wrong kind of intervention. That was the intervention by emperors to crush popular insurrections. 
Well, we should be intervening in the Greek War of Independence, for instance, in 1821. And so the debate began about whether or not to believe in a society of nations meant you should be in favor of intervention or against intervention. The great theorist of this, Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini, 19th century Italian thinker, wanted the British to intervene to, for Italian independence. And he was furious that the British refused to intervene. Richard Cobden, a British theorist, was a non-interventionist. He thought you, you shouldn't start intervening. So these two positions have been staked out. Now, what do I think? I was in, I was, my views on this took shape during the war in Bosnia in the 1990s. I wanted a Western intervention. I was glad when the Western in, West intervened. I thought it intervened too late, but it was better late than never. When it came to Kosovo, I had very, very mixed feelings. I was not at all convinced that the case for intervention had been made. When it came to Iraq, I was out there in the streets against intervention. What do I mean? I don't think there's a single answer. I think now the presumption has to be against intervention because it has been done too often and because it has been done too often by Western powers in areas that they formerly ruled. And therefore, the historical associations with imperialism are generally overwhelming for the people involved. So uh, I'm, I think the, my gut reaction in most cases now is that it's probably going to be a bad idea and you'd better show me ahead of time uh, why, why it's not, why, why it's a really good idea. But I, I don't think there's a single, this is not something you can argue from principle, I think. I think you have to argue on the merits of each particular case. This triumph of financial capital is storing up political problems for the future and will be unsustainable and that there will be some kind of reverse movement because actually the, the um, economic liberals of the 19th century never dreamed of the kind of movement of money around the world. They dreamed of the movement of goods and the movement of people. Uh, and that's what free trade was about. It got reinterpreted in the 1980s and the 1990s uh, that money should be able to move with this extraordinary frequency. And I, and I, I, I think this has been highly destabilizing. And it, frankly, I don't think it's been worth the benefits. And it would be a very good thing if it was re-regulated and reined in and you could keep the other dimensions of economic freedom. And so this is where talking about freedom has to be nuanced. There are certain kinds of freedoms that you might want to uh, uh, restrict in order to preserve other kinds of freedoms. Um, was it necessary to have banking liberalization at the same time as you had a freeing up of the internal market? I don't understand why you couldn't have one without the other. And we might actually be better off overall if we had had that. When you look at the emerging economies in countries like China, Brazil, others, the idea of development is very powerful, and some of these countries are more capitalist than, than, than Europe. What is the role of freedom versus development? Implicit in what you're suggesting is there's a kind of potential trade-off, right? That countries may be opting for development over freedom or not figuring out how they can have the two together. Um, you could write the history of the 20th century is the history of that debate and that trade-off too, and in Europe too. In other words, Europeans arguing in the 1920s that there was no use having freedom if you were going to have massive unemployment, that growth and development were as important, were more important. Uh, that was the basis of the Soviet model, a developmental model. Um, and it was, to a large extent, the basis of the Nazi model and the fascist model as well, that a certain restriction on liberty was a good price to pay and that liberty had been discredited. Um, 
there is a group of theorists of democracy and democracy promotion that has been active in the United States for about 20 years now, who feel very uncertain at the moment what the future of democracy and liberty around the world is, because as you say, the evidence is that there are plenty of countries that prioritize uh, development, uh, just as, as, as I repeat, just as we did in Europe in the early 20th century. I think that democracy promotion movement is totally unrealistic on almost every count, not least because it operates on the basis of a very idealized conception of what democracy is that has almost no relationship to the United States itself. So when you read some of this literature about, you know, these are the norms that we think the world should aspire to in liberal democracy, and then you look at the United States, I'll give you one example, the rule of law. Well, yes, in a certain sense, there is a rule of law. On the other hand, I don't, don't know if you've ever tried to um, um, read your way through a tax document in the United States. Absolutely impossible. So the rule of law there means complete legal ambiguity, opacity, with huge legal fees for lawyers. The reality, the sociological reality of the rule of law in America is not what these people are in fact trying to export around the world. And so it, it, it's a kind of mystification of, of democracy and an idealization of democracy. Um, and uh, the relationship between liberalism and democracy itself has always been historically very tense. There have been periods, well, think of de Tocqueville, when liberals were actually quite suspicious of democracy when they said there was a tension between liberty and equality. And the, this school of democracy promotion theorists that just ignore all of that, so it's obvious that there is this thing called liberal democracy. So for myself, I would always rather that democratic values were preserved and were preserved in Europe. But I feel on very much weaker ground telling other people in countries that I know very little about what to do. Because I haven't, you know, and I think here we come to a problem of intellectual, of understanding and cultural understanding. Most people in Europe do not know the first thing about what political ideas mean in Arabic or what political ideas mean in China. And not the first thing, not the first thing. And starting to talk about Muslim values or Confucian values, it hides the problem. That's not. That's not the issue. The issue is you'd really need to know what those kinds of debates look like. And we, we simply don't bother. Instead, we say you should, you should have this very thin conception of democracy. So I, 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 I think we're in a very weak position to be lecturing other people about what the trade-offs are here. Do you think there is a future for development and freedom? Um, Historians have started getting interested in, the, in, in how people imagine the future. Uh, so there's always a future for these concepts. Uh, uh, people have been imagining futures for concepts for, for decades. Uh, freedom in particular. Development is more more recent concept. I don't think people are going to stop thinking about freedom or meaning very different things uh, by it. And if by development you mean the desire for prosperity and growth and some kind of stability, they're going to be dreaming of that as well. And uh, they're going to be looking for combinations of the two as they, as they have been doing for the last 200 years or the period in which people thought about themselves as political subjects. So I think this is, there's no reason this is gonna stop anytime soon.